the, the genesis of, of, of this record, Say It To My Face, uh, uh, came from when I was doing this other project. And it was a book that I was trying to write about this musician. And it's loosely based on, on fact. But uh, it's about a musician who gets out of the military and uh, puts out a record and it does very well. And he's really disillusioned with the way the music business is and how they grind people up and that kind of thing. So I started recording his music to better understand the character I was writing about, and it really helped. And I started singing like this other guy, like it wasn't my voice. I never, I never put like you know on on the track on the you know if, if you list a track, people write down what's what. I'd always put Tommy Pace. I'd write down that. So it it made it very separate from what I would do. So when it came time to do the vocal, I just sang it like how this guy's voice would be. And then, like I said, I started recording all this stuff, and then I started producing it by putting little crackles of records on it. So, so it's supposed to be this old album that comes out. And like I said, it was the genesis of this next thing, because I started writing songs that were definitely not about Tommy Pace. They were, they were going different. My wife had given me a guitar around that point, and it was a new guitar, so when you pick up a new guitar, new things happen. And I just started feeling this really cool vibe of, of of freedom to be able to express what I had in my head through all this equipment that I know now how to use. We didn't know it was gonna be an album at that point. It was just gonna be a couple songs. And then I started talking to other guys in New York and I said, you know, if I need a band, I don't want it to be a band that I don't know or guys that, that are just, you know, really super great session players that, that would back me up. It would have to be a gang. And my immediate gang were my boys in New York. I got the blues. Hugh and the New Yorkers actually started at Platinum Island Studios and the Fellow Criminals were doing our first record there, we were mixing it. And in the next studio was this guy Cristiani who was doing his own stuff and Chris is uh, one of the primary members of the New Yorkers and uh, we formed a friendship and that kind of introduced me a whole group of musicians. We all used to hang out and jam and it got to a point where we were writing songs and we were kind of slapping them together and then about, I guess it was about five years ago we started actually, you know, seriously recording a couple songs. Originally, a lot of the songs that I did by myself, I did, you know, just I'd do a click track and it'd be an acoustic guitar, a vocal, maybe some bass, maybe a little keyboards, maybe a little guitar, but it was a guide kind of thing. And then I'd send it off to uh, my friend Pete Levin because he plays with the Blind Boys of Alabama. He plays B3 organ with them. He's amazing. And you don't ever have to tell anyone, these guys, what to do. They are just, they, they know exactly what to do. So he'll send me back like an organ track and a piano track that fits perfectly, you know. That goes, you know, to Frank up in Leicester, who plays in The Criminals, and he'll come back with him and Naeem doing beautiful vocals and great drums and, you know, just, you know, ukulele too, which was really cool. And it fitting was automatic. It was great because we knew each other as friends and we kind of knew the sensibilities of each song, like what that song needed. And it was, it was really good because it's, it's kind of selfish for me because I get to play with my best friends now. You know, all these guys get to get together and play. Uh, but getting it all together was, I think, important with Tim Latham, uh, especially. Yeah, for those who don't know, Tim Latham and I have been working together since we got our record deal. Uh, EMI Records asked us what producer we wanted to get. We wanted to get Bob Power because he did Tribe Called Quest and uh, a bunch of other stuff we really liked. And Bob got our demo. We had a meeting with Bob and he said, you don't need me. You guys produce that. All you need is the best engineer in the world, and his name's Tim Latham. We met him, uh, and it, he looks like a cop, so I came into the offices at EMI and walked into my man Mike Schnapp's office, who was our A&R guy, and I swore I, was, I, was, I got caught for something I did a long time ago. I, and I was like, oh, and he goes, this is Tim Latham. I was like, oh, man. He goes, I was like, I thought you were a cop. He goes, my dad was you know, a lieutenant, a, an inspector in the NYPD. And I was like, wow, man, you got that cop thing going on big time. And we immediately hit it off. And, He's one of those dudes that knows the project and wants the people who are making the music to be happy with what's going on. Working with him was like one of those things we've been doing it for 15 years. And it was, he was, you know, besides being a friend, he was like the fourth member of the Fun Level Criminals for so long. So when I initially started doing this, I knew that I'd probably have to have professional help <laughs> because I know what I'm doing when it comes to this stuff, but only up to a certain extent from what I've learned from Tim. So I, I called Tim up and I said, you know, I know this is a really big ask, but do you have time to look over some tracks? And he said, send him over. What he's done with this song, he's taken the idea that you initially have in your brain and, and, and puts it out there more eloquently than you could possibly do it. And I guess that's why he's such a great producer and we're so lucky to have him involved. 
uh, of course, being a New Yorker myself, you know, in London, trying to do a, a record called Huey and the New Yorkers, I had to go to New York. So we went there and we, we, uh, we had like a great time just getting back together. For us as just guys, you know, writing these songs and, you know, we hope you like it, obviously, but we like them. So we, we kind of wanted to put those songs in particular out. And uh, it's a great thing to have happened, going to New York and seeing them and seeing the excitement on their faces. <laughs> Now once down on Broadway, there was a fly man. He was strong and willing to help his fellow. A lot of people, you know, they might know a little bit about the fun of criminals, but they know that I have radio shows on the BBC, and that's uh, where I get to pull out all these songs that I knew from my past. And on this record, there is a little bit of that, because, you know, when you produce a record, you kind of have this uh, flow in mind. And I think the flow's there, but uh, there's a lot of different stuff on there, dynamically, style-wise. That's what makes uh, my radio shows cool, but that's what makes this record really cool. Well, I mean, a lot of people probably will compare what we I did with uh, the Fun of a Criminals or what I did by myself, but there was always been, and every Fun of a Criminal record, good, bad, or different, there was always one of my tracks. Now, this stuff is kind of all the stuff that I came up with that I didn't think that was Fun of a Criminal stuff. To draw the line really simply is that there's like a lot of singing on my part. You know, I do a lot of singing and, and mostly with the criminals it's emceeing. I kind of delve into my country uh, and blues uh, heritage a lot more on this record than I did on previous Fun of a Criminal's records. And I think this one has, you know, I think a, a more serious edge to it as far as what I'm trying to say. The lyrical content's are very more direct, you know, and, I always wanted to make a record of these songs, you know, I always thought they were important. And for me, it's a dream realized because of the people that were involved. I mean, you know, Ray Staff mastered it at Air Studios. He did London Calling. He did Physical Graffiti. I don't even have to go on, <laughs> you know what I mean? So that's that. It sounds really good. And I know the rest of the guys are psyched, too, because, I mean, I sent them the masters and, you know, nothing but... Nothing but, whoa, yo, yo, you know, like just a lot of yo's <laughs> coming from the New Yorkers, but positive yo's, you know, not like yo, but yo. You take a step to the left, another to the right, like dodging bullets in Brooklyn on a hot Friday night. There was a lot of love involved in this, in the making of this record. I think that's the most important thing. It was kind of the thing that led me to down the path of, of wanting to uh, give my share of, of the record sales that I get to charities, you know, and charities that are close to me, or you know, like charities that deal with veterans that are coming back from these wars with, with serious injuries, you know, mental and physical, and giving them a little bit of a, a leg up or getting back into the world. And so that was something that I immediately I did that and good things started happening. Danny Clinch, who's like a world-class photographer, uh, I e emailed him about playing harmonica because he plays harmonica in the Tangiers Blues Band, which I'm the, the lap steel player in occasionally when I'm in New York. And uh, he asked me, well, who's doing your photos? It's doing it for love sounds really corny. It sounds real John Lennon, but he wasn't too off the mark. I mean, if you if you put a good vibe out there and, and do it for love, good things happen. And it came out so much better than I thought it would, you know. Hopefully people will dig it. Mm -hmm.